to introduce Dr. J. Nicole Jackson Beckham, who teaches in Randolph's communications department. To conclude the symposium, Dr. Jackson Beckham will present her lecture, Food Access and Incarceration. Dr. Jackson Beckham earned her bachelor's degree in English from Virginia Tech and went on to earn a Bachelor of Fine Arts degree in Visual Communication from American Intercontinental University. She received her master's degree in Communication Studies from San Diego State University and her PhD in Communication Studies from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Her teaching career began when she served as a graduate teaching as associate at San Diego State. Also while living in California, she was an adjunct instructor at Grassmont Community College and San Diego Miramar College and lectured at San Diego State University at Platt College. Upon returning to the East Coast for her doctorate studies, she was awarded the William and Williams Royster Fellowship and served as a graduate teaching fellow for the University of North Carolina's Department of Communication Studies. She taught for the last three years at Piedmont Virginia Community College in Charlottesville before joining Randolph. Since 2014, she has joined the faculty at Piedmont Virginia Community College in teaching college courses at the Fubana Correctional Center for Women. The Sunshine Program allows residents of Virginia's highest security correctional facility for women to earn associate degrees while incarcerated. Uh, please join me in welcoming Dr. Jackson. Um, they reveal something really important about the carceral state in the United States. 
Um, and that is that our knowledge of it and the people who live inside of it uh, is frighteningly scant. It's cobbled together from stereotypes and fictional media representations. I would go further and say that, that our correctional systems constitute a placeless space. Now, this is a distinction that I'm going to talk more about later, but I just want you to kind of file it away for this, for the moment. Uh, the correctional system is a space. It occupies space, but it is not a place. Another question I get asked often is, do you teach regular college courses when you teach in the prison? Mm -hmm. um, and the answer is yes, um, they are regular college courses. However, I do have to make um, some changes. Um, these are because they lack even the most basic resources inside the prison. There is no internet access uh, in a prison. They have extremely limited computer access that generally has to be scheduled as much as a week in advance. And they're supported by an outdated library that's full of disparate materials. Moreover, there are serious restrictions on the, the things that I can bring into the prison to provide. Everything has to be approved, searched, and vetted. Multimedia things like instructional videos or even sound are nearly impossible to bring in, and I have to do so on um, federally encrypted devices. I can't even staple the articles that I bring in for my students because that's considered a security hazard. But overwhelmingly, the students I teach in prison are excellent. I'm not exaggerating when I say that they are the most reliable, hardest working, and most consistently successful students I have encountered in 12 years of college teaching. Now many people who hear this say, well, of course, they have so much free, undistracted time to dedicate it to college coursework. Those people are often surprised to hear that nearly all of my students work full time in the prison, effectively running the institution in which they are incarcerated, cooking meals in the chow hall, cleaning the immense facility every day, processing tons of laundry, running the commissary, staffing the library, keeping the grounds, and even doing administrative work in prison offices. They aren't successful because they have extra time. It is because they are, to a person, extraordinarily grateful for their access to higher education, to get to pay for it. They are a group of students who see the incredible value of being heard and to have someone take interest in their ideas. Because let's face it, many of them, women of color, women experiencing mental illness, impoverished women, weren't being heard before they were incarcerated. And now that they have been, most people will dismiss their thoughts, their ideas, their concerns before they even dare to utter them. Perhaps nowhere was the value of being heard to these students more evident than in a public speaking course I taught in prison. Now in general, public speaking is a course that is universally hated by students and instructors alike. <laughs> Um, students generally hate it because they are forced to confront a very real fear. Over and over, uh, surveys are done of what are Americans' largest fears. Public speaking over and over comes in as number one. Number two is death. <laughs> <laughs> Teachers hate public speaking because essentially they are attempting to lead a group of terrified people who resent what you are making them do. But this wasn't the case at Flamin. Uh, and it was in my public speaking course that I had something of a personal and professional revelation. In teaching public speaking, it's common to assign a persuasive speech assignment, where students are tasked with composing and delivering a speech in which they attempt to change their classmates' beliefs, attitudes, and perhaps most challenging, their behavior. And I had one student uh, take this assignment as a chance to try to persuade her, her co-residents in Flavana not to drink the institutional void. This was not a metaphor. 
She wanted them to have stopped drinking the only free alternative to water that is provided in the prison. A Kool-Aid-like beverage that comes in a sack of powder and is reconstituted with water. Now her speech revolved around the health uh, risks of drinking this over and over again. Um, specifically, it's full of artificial sweeteners. Natural sweeteners are not common in prisons because they can be spontaneously fermented if you leave them alone. Um, and they're full of dyes. If you've ever seen Kool-Aid, you're pretty <laughs> accustomed to that. Um, but also because the prisoners put the Kool-Aid, um, once it is acquired, um, to a number of alternative uses. Um, it is used as a permanent hair dye, commonly. Mm -hmm. uh, they will often mix it with Vaseline and create lip glosses. Um, the kitchen staff uses it as an abrasive to clean the flat tops, uh, flat top grills. And they also put it in the uh, dishwasher to help decalcify and decline dishwashers. But it wasn't all this information that she brought to bear, which was impressively collected and um, meticulously cited without the help of the internet. Um, it was how she closed, saying, they can surround us with all the tools we need to slowly kill ourselves in here. They can make it taste good. They can even make it free. But we don't have to drink it just because they give it to us. We can think about more than getting out. We can be healthy and whole when we get out. I really started to think and reflect upon everything that I'd heard in prison about the food from my students. I thought about how many times I'd been asked if I would excuse missed class time so that a student would not miss their scheduled time to shop in the commissary. Often doesn't come, comes about weekly or every two weeks. I thought about all the stories I've been told about residents cooking food with the communal clothing irons uh, that are in residential facilities and all of the contraband recipes that they're able to cobble together from items from the commissary. I thought about the general level of disgust that accompanied every conversation about the food served in the chow hall. I thought about the rumors of the neutral loaf which is a usually nutritionally complete but intentionally unsavory mash of foodstuffs into a loaf that is served to inmates who have to go to SEG. This is short for segregation, FCCW's voluntary confinement practice. But most of all, I remember when I delivered the news that our college could no longer host a catered dinner a banquet that we used to hold at the end of the year for graduates of the Sunshine Program. The news that they wouldn't have this catered dinner was met with tears, out outright crying. And when asked about why they were so despaired, it wasn't the quality of the chicken dinner, as they affectionately called it, it was because they were going to get salad. And that was some of the only fresh produce that they could have. So all of this began to re excuse me, resonate with the concerns of my emerging research in critical food studies. Specifically, I study good food movements. Um, these might be things like farmers markets and CSAs, organics and fair trade, community gardens and, and urban farms. Um, and specifically, I ask why some good food movements, particularly those that are addressing Places or populations that are in the most need more ineffective. Good food movements have experienced success in addressing a lot of different goals, um, but poverty alleviation is not one. So let me be clear also in saying that my goal in doing this work is understanding why these movements don't work so we can make them work. address the problem of food deserts um, are of particular interest to me. If you're unfamiliar, a food desert is essentially defined as an area 
in which it's difficult to buy affordable, good quality, fresh food. And while these areas can exist in both urban and rural geographies, many of them are in the urban centers in the U.S. This is what um, I call essentially a corner store based economy. Um, we have an urban food desert in downtown Lynchburg. Um, it's an area where there are no operating grocery stores, there are low levels of vehicle ownership, um, and corner stores can dominate your options as far as food provision. And so, as I thought about the food desert economy and what defines it, corner stores full of foods with low nutritional value that are offered at premium prices, the connection really hit home. This is a prison commissary. This is an urban food desert. So as a researcher, I look at food from a food system's perspective. A food system includes all of the processes and infrastructure involved in feeding a population. It means growing, harvesting, processing, packaging, transporting, marketing, consuming, and the disposal of food and food-related items. And importantly, a food system operates within as in, and is influenced by social, political, economic, <coughs> excuse me, and environmental contexts. What you see when you take a food system's perspective and look at correctional food systems and urban food deserts is that they are eerily similar in a number of ways. First, there are a number of structural similarities that you will see between these two food systems. And specifically, residents in these areas are sandwiched between two completely non-ideal food options, one subsidized and one unsubsidized. If you look at the subsidized options in food deserts, for example, you see high reliance on places like soup kitchens and food banks. Now, when you think about addressing hunger or poverty with foods with food kitchens or food, excuse me, food banks, selection and quality are secondary to quantity and availability. It's, it's really just about getting people fed. Um, and specifically, utilization and minimizing waste are chief concerns. So there's a slant towards shelf-stable items like canned foods, box foods, things that generally contain, contain a lot of preservatives and are highly processed. These are generally also considered options of last resort. And so there really isn't a focus on longevity, on consumption with health in mind. It's, it's pretty much a bad day. In prison, the chow hall is for subsidized options. <laughs> And there, there is a focus on cost savings over quantity. Uh, this is a typical prison meal. The average cost of um, prison meals is about $2 per inmate per day. Um, this is compared to the general population, which is at about $9 per day. Um, and so when people create meals nutritionally within uh, the prison system, this really isn't, again, about composing meals to be appetizing or thinking long-term about health issues. They're simply trying to figure out how can they deliver guide, food, basic, basic guidelines of food with this very, very small budget. Because of this, there's been also a trend toward privatization within uh, food industries in prison. Uh, Philadelphia-based corporation um, Aramark, which makes about uh, 14 point three. Uh, billion dollars in annual profit, serves 380 million years of, of meals a year in the prison system as the, as the sole provider for more than 600 prisons and other correctional facilities in the U.S. Um, this is despite the fact that they have been repeatedly fined over scandals and food safety crises. Unsubsidized options are equally as uh, not ideal. Generally, in urban food deserts, you see people attempting to escape the stigma of accepting free food um, and trying to consume properly. Um, but again, this leads people to the corner store where markups are very common and the products sold tend towards shelf stability, calorie dense, 
low nutritional value of food. Similarly, the inmates in prison facilities often try to escape what are generally unappetizing options in the chow hall, and so they use the commissary. Uh, you won't be surprised to know that most commissaries in the United States are privatized. Um, there are three major net, uh, commissary networks, Keefe, Aramark, and Trinity Services Group. Um, they generally contract with the entire prison system, and there's no competition beyond winning the contract. Um, once the commissary is in the prison, they pretty much set prices wherever they want. Um, only a couple of states that have policies or legislation that limits the markup that a commissary can charge for the products it offers in prison. Um, one of the best or most restrictive pieces of legislation comes out of Delaware, which says that a uh, commissary can mark up no more than 20% of market value. Um, in other places, we see much larger markups. In the summer of 2016 or 2015, I worked with a pair of Randolph College undergraduates to do some market basket research. Um, we took a prison commissary lift from Cleveland and compared the prices from the commissary to items available at the Boonesboro Kroger. Uh, we went down to the Miles Market, which is around the corner from where I live, and a couple of corner stores in downtown. Uh, we found, as a result, that the commissary prices were not only higher than grocery store prices, but they were actually higher than corner store prices. And for some items, the markup was as, uh, close to 100%. Interestingly, items that are of most uh, necessity or nutritive value, for example, they sell those pouches of toothfish, um, were marked up much more than other items. Uh, inmates can buy a case of soda for pretty much the same amount you can get it at. What's other, another interesting structural feature here is that production is completely absent from both of these food systems. We don't have producers of products in urban food deserts, nor do we have producers uh, in the prison system. Another similarity is the demographics that you see in both of these food systems. Um, these are food systems that are, dim, are disproportionately populated by people of color, they are disproportionately populated by people living in poverty, and they are disproportionately populated with people who are living with mental illness. There are also a similar set of deleterious effects in both of these food systems. Obesity and malnourishment, which sounds like they can't go together, but often do in both systems, um, are common in both. In the Fulbea Correctional Facility for Women, the average weight gain for inmates in their first to six months in the facility is about 16 pounds. Uh, this is because they're eating um, high-calorie, carbohydrate-forward um, diets. Um, moreover, the incidences of food-related illnesses are disproportionately high in both urban food deserts and in prison populations. Uh, I was able to get some anecdotal information from some of the staff at Fumana. They think the rate of uh, food-related illnesses like diabetes is hovering about 30% in the prison population. So one of the things I've been looking at as far as good food movements that I'm assessing is um, a movement called the Food Justice Movement. Um, and I'm particularly interested in it because this is a movement that has been most consistently aimed at alleviating food deserts. Um, food justice is defined when communities exercise their right to grow, sell, and eat healthy food. And where healthy food is defined as fresh, nutritious, affordable, culturally appropriate, and grown with care for the well-being of land, workers, and animals. It's important also to situate this food movement um, kind of within the history of food movements in the US. Um, so quickly to kind of talk through, if you start over there on your left, um, the kind of things that we call good food, food movements originate um, with kind of countercultural good food movements. We're talking about the 1960s in California specifically. Um, so these were kind of back to the land type movements, and they were real, there was a real kind of concern for both the environment and community in these movements. As you come forward into the 70s and um, the kind of original food co-ops that come out of this west coast, uh, back to the land, kind of hippie commune uh, movements, 
switches to kind of niche markets, right? So think about um, the 1980s and 90s when niche food markets were really kind of exploding. Um, now, our contemporary good food, food movements are kind of exist within what you might call the green economy. Um, so, organics are not only organic, they are also profitable. Right? Um, and most of the people who encounter good food movements are doing so um, through the retail structure. The food just dismiss movement that comes out of these contemporary movements attempts in some ways to make a break. Um, and this is because it's aligning itself with this um, concept of food sovereignty, which is a community-centered effort um, to define one's own food system with one's own standards. So if we look at food activism or food movements um, within the green economy, um, one of the kind of most limiting things that I've found is that food activism tends to be planned and deployed in terms of the logics of neoliberal capitalism. And when I talk about neoliberalism, I'm talking about a set of kind of commitments that have been associated with economic practice as we've come forward. Specifically, minimizing the role of state, right? so um, reducing government spending, removing regulation, right? encouraging the growth of the private sector, so um, again, um, touting free markets and removing any sort of obstacle to um, free economic exchange. Um, and along with this comes an idea of individual responsibility. Right? So if you are not performing well at, in this particular economy, it's because you have done something wrong. Um, specifically, purchasing behaviors then and this type of activism become the center for problem solving. Um, and we see a lot of this in discussions of food deserts. One of the first and sometimes only major intervention offered is build a grocery store. Um, and if you think about it, grocery stores are not the only ways through which people can be fed. Um, and specifically, within this um, paradigm, the primary unit of analysis for activist intervention is the individual, right? um, not the community. So how do we change individual people's eating habits, individual people's purchasing behaviors? In contrast, if we look at food activism within the food sovereignty paradigm, um, activism is planned, deployed, and evaluated in terms of community's goals, right? not the goals of the economy. Specifically, these efforts um, take a number of diverse forms. Um, they include diverse stakeholders and they include various markers of success. One of the things you'll see most often is that food activist efforts are often deemed a failure if they're not profitable. Um, but within this, kind of, uh, within this kind of framework, profitability isn't the only way to analyze whether something works or not. Uh, community resilience becomes the primary focus of problem solving efforts. And the primary unit of analysis for activist intervention is the community and not the individual. So remember before I asked you to kind of file away this idea that a space may occupy space, but it's not a place. And I want to talk to you a little bit about that distinction now. Space, we generally think of as physical location, but place is what happens to space when it becomes familiar, when it becomes known. If you think about an empty house as a space, it becomes a place when it's full of your furniture and your artwork and your memories and that particular odor that will always be associated with your family's occupation of that space. And I think a lot of the people who are the artists who are collected in this exhibition today are really concerned with this notion of space and place. Um, if we look at John Jackson's aerial photos of prisons, right, um, he's, it seems to be making commentary about the anonymity of their space. Right? If you look at this beautiful series of photographs on the back wall, um, you see an artist working to place prisons in geography so that they are present and known and we can't just ignore them. Even over here, these murals, right, you see someone making places out of spaces in the institution of prisons. And so what I want to do and what I'm calling for is a placement 
of correctional food systems within the food justice movement. <coughs> Specifically, I think the food justice movement and correctional food systems and the people who live and abide in them can benefit from this relationship mutually. Specifically, I think the correctional populations can benefit uh, from the intervention of food justice uh, activist efforts as they've been made thus far. Um, this is a basically a community garden, but this is inside St. Quentin. Um, this is one of the gardens created by the Insight Gardening Program, which is um, an, an organization that works to build gardens within prison populations across the U.S. The Insight Garden Program has been going on for um, more than a decade in this particular prison, and the results they get are remarkable. Um, the population of people who have gone through this program and been re-released into society are experiencing less than 10% remitted recidivism. Um, recidivism is basically likeliness to come back to prison. The rate of recidivism, recidivism for the general population at, at San Quentin is about 60%. Um, so those going through this program are just not coming back. Um, this is not only really good for the graduates of the program, this is good for society at large. Um, the estimated lack of recidivism among people who are coming through this program has saved the state of California about $40 million uh, because it costs an average of $47,000 per year per inmate. So when people don't come back, everyone wins. These type of programs also change people's perspective on their role in the community. You hear graduates of programs of like this talking about having become producers for the first time in their life. Not being merely consumers, not being merely takers, but producers of something. You see people enrolled in these programs thinking hard about their role in the communities they used to be a part of and may once again be a part of. The Insight Gardening Program also has um, gardens in uh, prison in Maryland. Uh, they don't process or eat the food that they grow in that garden in the prison facility itself. They actually send it all to the communities from which these offenders came as a means of repaying the community for their crime. But most importantly, lots of people who come through this pro these programs um, end up taking leadership roles in their communities um, and starting programs on the outside, helping people who are reentering. I don't think the benefits are just one way. I think the food justice movement has a lot to learn uh, from the correctional food system as well. And it's specifically about um, the constraints that the food justice movement to date has felt um, simply, one, because of a lack of creativity, but second, because it is embedded within a kind of structure of economic thinking. Um, it's clear that food systems can't solely be food purchasing systems. And unfortunately, that's the way that we tend to look at them. The prison has a number of programs that are not just focused on producing food. In fact, Insight's program is more about job skills training and life building. The food is a beneficial add-on to what's happening there. And I think this is a model that could really work if we bring it outside of prison. What if our food justice activism in our community wasn't just about a way to enable different kinds of food purchasing, but was about community development, which was about individual development, which is about education in communities, which is about teaching people to become producers and creative people in their, in their communities. So in closing, I think it's important for us to take seriously the idea that prisons are not for punishment, but are for rehabilitation. And if we are going to take seriously the notion that prisons are in existence to rehabilitate members of our community, there may be no other way, better way to do this than through food. Food nourishes, food teaches us about growth and cycles of production and consumption. Food gives us intimate emotional connections to other people and other places. So thank you, and if you have any questions, please let me know. I would love to just have a discussion with you. Um, something to 
add to this anecdotal um, story that um, I was lucky to have dinner with some of the um, women of York last night. And they were talking to us about their, you know, the title of the piece that they um, made that's in the gallery next door is called Shared Dining. And it actually comes from, I guess, one of their chow halls that is, that is a place where people who don't usually get to see each other get to come together. And the other thing that was interesting about that space was they felt like they could take their time eating. And they said in other places they would have guards right there getting them to eat as fast as they could and then get, get out of there. I mean, so I was just thinking about that piece of the food system too, like mm -hmm. the kind of time that you get to have and community. Um, I, don't, I don't know if there's anything. Yeah, to say no, about it's, it's interesting because I think, um, at least in the prison, um, food and, and the consumption of food becomes a really charged um, space right? and, and a really um, significant platform where power struggles happen, both between the institution and the inmates and even between the inmates. Um, in fact, this is why we had to cancel the cake of dinner that we used to do in a prison and was considered too divisive between the inmates. Um, so I think you know, what you notice about people taking their time, um, this is absolutely the case at Flavetta as well. Um, in fact, I used to teach courses right after the allotted lunchtime, and um, it was kind of an understanding that like I started when they got there because they were not leaving chow early. Um, not because the food was great, but because it was one of these only spaces where there was a little bit more social autonomy as far as who can talk to who and for how long. Um, and so that's a particularly kind of an important space, I guess, in their kind of daily residential life. Are there assigned seats at, in chow halls and prisons? So generally you, um, in this facility at least, you eat by building. So there are uh, six residential buildings at FCCW, I believe there are six. So your building gets called, um, so they kind of make the announcement, buildings by or going to chow. Uh, and then they kind of line up across the yard to the, to the cafeteria facility. Um, and it's kind of a lineup that determines where people are going to sit. It's kind of once you're cued that you kind of stay that way. Um, but one of the things you also notice in prison is that proximity really stops being a requirement for conversation. Uh, so, you know, one of the things I notice when, when the educational building is at the far back of the, the facility I teach in. So you come in the front door and you have to cross the entire prison yard. Um, and I have noticed almost every time when I'm walking the yard, there are just people yelling across the yard to each other. Um, so, you know, this is kind of what happens at Chow. You know, there might be someone two tables over, but if you don't, you're going to talk to them because this may be your only opportunity to do so. Do you ever experience, like, in your, in your research, have you found that there's been pushback for pro implementing programs in prisons to empower people? Yes. Um, and, and could you talk about that? Um, yeah, I mean, the first time I presented some of this research with people, the, the biggest response was, if, if you want good food, don't go to prison. Mm -hmm. um, and the response I always want to give people is, the attempt to eat good food is what got most of these people into prison. Mm -hmm. um, because most of them are nonviolent offenders, um, particularly in Flavana, um, there's lots of thefts, um, and they're about trying to provide resources. Um, most of the drug crimes are money related as well. Um, so, you know, I, I, I guess I understand that kind of prison is not supposed to be a vacation um, type of attitude, but I think um, it's a fairly easy way to avoid looking at some really severe structural issues, um, both inside and outside of the prison facility. Um, and, you know, as much as a lot of people don't have a sympathetic um, stance toward people who may be committing crimes or incarcerated. I think the argument that it costs us a lot of money to keep people in prison resonates universally. Taxpayers pay a remarkable amount of money housing people, and it is in all of our best interests 
um, if people are effectively rehabilitated and don't have to go back. Um, for that reason, um, we've, we've shown kind of in the United States that prison doesn't operate as a deterrent. Um, people manage to get in um, with, with impunity. Um, and so rehabilitation efforts need to be effective um, so that at least once people are in, they don't come back. Um, repeat offenders are the most expensive. Mm -hmm. So if an inmate has a health issue that would be really provoked by bad food, or mm -hmm. food that they, you know, <coughs> eat, like diabetes or something, they they do not have a choice, I'm sure, and the person does not provide anything for those people related to their health issue. And do you know if they provide medication for these people? How does yeah. that work? So um, there are only a couple of deviations that you can make from the standard child diet. Um, the most common is actually religious um, exceptions. Um, so if you don't eat pork, um, and there are certain ways to um, get a vegetarian diet, um, or you know, if you don't eat gluten, like there's some ways that you can kind of get some variations. But the process of getting approval is onerous and um, most people just don't bother. Um, the prison does have to provide a vegetarian option every time they provide a meal. Um, but I'll give you an example of how this works. Um, so they have to provide us a, a kind of central protein. Um, usually this is uh, beans or you know, like a beef patty or maybe sometimes special days chicken. A lot of times it'll be two hard-boiled eggs. Um, so some sort of central protein. If you're a vegetarian, your vegetarian option that day might be um, two grilled cheese sandwiches. Um, I guess the cheese is the protein alternative. Um, they also have to provide a starch. Um, it is almost always, through all meals, three pieces of white bread. Um, they have to provide a vegetable. Often the vegetables come, again, shelf stability is really important for prisons to keep their budgets down. So um, canned vegetables and even better pickled vegetables. Um, so, yeah, so um, you often get like sauerkraut or something along those lines. Um, so to recap, right, if you're a vegetarian, you might get um, seven pieces of white bread, right, between the two grilled cheeses and your starch, um, two pieces of American cheese food, and some sauerkraut. Right? Um, so it's, it's not hard to see why weight gain and diabetes are uh, you know, so rampant when that's one meal. You might eat half a loaf of white bread per meal. Um, the prison, this prison in particular, does have an entire hospital facility within it. It is also privatized, so there's a contract for a facility running the hospital there. Um, and they um, heavily medicate um, for lots of um, lots of different conditions, including um, food-based illnesses. Many of the women who I talk are taking medications for hypertension, for diabetes, um, for a range of things that probably would be better and more inexpensively mitigated with a better diet. Um, but that's it's just kind of how it works. That, uh, we were another conversation with women of your last night was about how um, how expensive it is to buy a piece of soap. Mm -hmm. um, but you can get drugs for free with very little effort. You can say, I can't sleep, or I feel like I'm worried, and there's free and generous. Dis the dispensing of, of those things is, is so they, they talked about how sad it was to see so many of their sisters come in and just become zombies. So they're, they're feeding themselves. It's not food, but it's, it's, it's uh, just prevalent. Did you see that at Alabama, that kind of, uh, I mean, where, did they just have that kind of free access to, and without very much procedure, you know, just? Yeah, it was, I didn't get a great sense of the procedure, but the, the degree to which people are medicated is really apparent. I mean, one of the, when I'm crossing the yard to go to the back, one of the first buildings I crossed, there's a, 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 the clinic, and there's basically just a window to the outside, which is where you pick up your meds. Mm -hmm. And there was always a huge line, uh, a 
people just kind of waiting to pick up their medication. Um, so you got the sense that there was just a ton of it um, there. But I think um, this, the self-medicating that you're talking about was, um, is something I heard from my students quite a lot, you know, um, that they, that prison is hard, prison life is hard, and to some degree probably should be hard, but that lots of women are self-medicating by buying a package of Oreos at the commissary, right, because, like, this is the one kind of source of, you know, indulgent pleasure one can give oneself. Um, and, you know, we may do so and, you know, head down to the burger and buy a three-dollar package of cookies, but when um, a package of Oreos costs $6 and you make 25 to 40 cents an hour, um, that package of Oreos is a day's work. Um, so it, it's, it's challenging. I have two questions here. One, I think a simple, factual one, which is simply, do we have in the state of Virginia the prison system, any prison that is allowing the inmates to grow and then eat their own food? The related, more complicated question is there has been a movement over the last several decades to continue to privatize the prison system. And it seems to me, at least I think, there are a lot of conflict of interest that are um, attached to that trend. So, for example, the idea of allowing inmates to grow and eat their healthy food, do you think there is a way in which the privatization prevents that from happening? Yes. Um, so, in Virginia, we have lots of prison facilities that produce food, um, and some that also grow like flowers and shrubs for use in like schools and other types of landscaping facilities. But in Virginia, there's no person that does production for consumption. Um, it's, it's almost, it's pretty plantation-like. Uh, so they're kind of just farm labor, essentially. Um, whether or not thing, that would ever be allowed in Virginia, I don't know. It's something I've kind of been pushing a button on for a while and would love to see happen. Uh, there are a ton of concerns um, when it comes for growing and eating your own food. Um, not, you know, one of the most basic one is um, tools. Right? Like if you're, there's a population of people who are not allowed to have staples. Um, you know, how, what do they work with? Right? Um, secondarily, um, there are just logistical issues. So even at San Quentin and some of these other prisons that have burns, you'll notice that almost all the food they grow is like this high. Uh, so you can't grow anything that would have messed with sidelines um, because they don't want people to be able to hide. Um, so there's the logistics of it are not insignificant, and so you know, a lot of people don't want to take that effort because it's not necessarily seen as beneficial. Like you know, they can't produce enough food to make a huge difference. Um, what they're finding at programs like Insight is that you don't have to produce enough food to make a difference. Um, for example, the addition of a tomato to a plate um, not only provides like a, a needed boost in vitamin C and A, um, but it changes people's way about thinking about who they are and how they live with the prison. Right? Like, um, it's, it's really about aesthetic things or effective things like color and taste and texture um, and connections to things. Um, if you have a chance, check out the Insight Garden um, Program's website. They have some really great videos uh, interviewed with people who have been through the program. And there was a man whose um, testimony kind of arrests me every time I see it. Um, he just talks about um, how, like, seeing something through. Like, I grew this, I took care of this, I fed and watered and fertilized it, and now it is bearing fruit. Right? Um, this idea that he doesn't know that he'd ever nurtured anything for that amount of sustained time in his life. Um, and it was, it's a really powerful video to understand that this is just not about putting food on plates. Um, the trend toward privatization, um, personally, is troubling. Um, and I think for a number of reasons, kind of some up here and some down here, but there are some basic things that come with this trend that are that I think are really troubling. Um, specifically, when commissary networks come in from the outside, 
Um, what, it doesn't just save the institution cost because they're no longer providing a service, and because generally um, he for Aramark will give them, uh, they get uh, commission, I almost said kickbacks, uh, they get commission on the sales of the products that they sell in the food. Um, but it also allows the facility to provide less because it's available in the commissary. Um, so for example, um, at Flavana, uh, they used to provide, I believe they used to provide tampons um, because it's preventable equipment. Um, now, they don't do that anymore. You have to buy them from the commissary. Um, you can, I think they provide sanitary items for free, but if you want something more, you have to buy it. Um, lots of facilities have now saying, we'll give you soap, but you need to buy toothpaste. Um, so it allows the, the institution to kind of minimize the things that it's providing, particularly things that can conceivably be thought of as luxury items, and then put them in, in the commissary, and then make commission off their sale. Okay. Um, and it's interesting, right, because most people who are working there are making 25 cents to 40 cents an hour, as I mentioned, they can't afford to buy lots of things uh, from the commissary, particularly because they're marked up. So what's happening is their families on the outside are subsidizing their, their accounts. Um, and if you think about where an overwhelming or uh, disproportionate number of the families are located, um, you're talking again about urban food desert areas. And this is just another way that um, things are being extracted from those communities because they're subsidizing prison accounts to buy food. Um, so. Hopefully that answers your question. How easy or difficult is it to get the names of the corporations who are providing for sale these items in the commissary, etc.? Do you have to go to Freedom of Information to get it, or is this somehow handy on the web? Yeah. So. Um so a lot of the commissary providers, like Keith um, Group, they have their own line of products um, that are specifically distributed by them. But they also do distribute some name brand products. So it's usually kind of a, a little bit of both. Um, it's not that difficult. But what's interesting is the commissary price list that I worked with for my research, um, I was not supposed to have. Um, you are not supposed to circulate the price lists. Um, and it's a little bit of a kind of act of resistance when people put them online so you can find them. Um, I was given one by a family member or something. Um, so it's not that difficult, um, but these are pretty um, thoroughly vertically integrated corporations, right? So they produce their own lines of foods, mostly snack and junk foods. Uh, and then they have their own distribution, and then they have freight. So they're, they're pretty integrated from top to bottom. Um, what's interesting is that the largest commissary network is trying to acquire the third largest, and they, I mean, this is already an industry that's dominated by three companies. Um, and it seems like it's going to happen. So um, antitrust concerns, for some reason, don't seem to register them. We talk about these private corporations that are primarily <laughs> providing prison services. How do uh, the prisoners receive money? Yes. <laughs> so they have accounts um, that are kind of run through the prisons. It's almost like a banking account, and um, it's accessible from the family. So you could transfer money from the outside, or use your credit card, or get a card. And, fund a prisoner's account. Um, once they're in the, um, the commissary, or once they're in the prison, they can either kind of almost run it like credit at the commissary, um, or what's becoming more common, are, there are these um, account kiosks, which are sort of like ATM machines, but like inmates are not allowed to handle currency, because they can pass it to each other. Um, so these kiosks allow for different types of um, account access so that you can do things like buy things from commissary or make phone calls or buy stamps. Um, unsurprisingly, the key group um, makes these kiosks as well. 
Um, they also have a company that um, that inmates can use to make phone calls. They're kind of like these paid phone booths, um, which recently got hit with a, a federal lawsuit because they were charging exorbitant prices for phone calls. Um, but again, these are the same the same companies are own all of this infrastructure. Uh, so it's so they, they do not receive any salary or anything like that. It's just credited to their accounts. So what happens, I mean, this is interesting too, because if you think about it, you work all day, you make a buck or two, it just credits your account. You don't see it, right? You don't handle it. So it makes it a lot easier to just go spend it on soda, because it's not really real to you anyway, if that makes sense, right? Like, it just happens in this abstract account 